Now, the rest of the story. Once upon a time, in Pierce Bridge, North Yorkshire, England, a most charming haven for travelers was known as the George Hotel. It's still there. In the late 19th century, it was a routine stop for horse-drawn coaches. The place was run by a couple of bachelor brothers named Jenkins. Oh, yes, there was an old clock in the lobby of the George Hotel. In fact, that's really what this story is about, the old clock. Kept very good time, such excellent time, in fact, that its accuracy was a frequent topic of conversation among hotel guests. And then one of the Jenkins brothers died, and strangely, suddenly, the old clock began losing time. Five, ten minutes a day at first, and then a half hour, sometimes 45 minutes, and eventually as much as an hour a day. The most skilled clocksmiths did their best to repair the ailing timepiece, but each failed, and after a while the clock's chronic unreliability became as remarkable as its precision had once been. Now remember, the clock started getting crotchety shortly after the death of the younger Jenkins' brother. Some said it was no wonder, then, that when the elder brother passed away in his ninetieth year, the old clock in the lobby of the George Hotel, fully wound, nevertheless stopped completely. The new hotel manager never tried to have the clock fixed. He just left it sitting silent, its hands resting in the position that they had assumed the moment old man Jenkins died. So... During the mid-1870s, an American songwriter named Henry Clay Work traveled to England, was told the story of the old clock in the George Hotel. Then, seeing the clock for himself, Henry was inspired to write a song about it and about the fascinating coincidence of its having stopped as its elderly owner breathed his last. A bit about Henry Work. You may remember his rousing Civil War anthem, Marching Through Georgia. Around the time of his trip to England, that was Henry's most popular tune. But now he wanted to write a song about this old clock, and it was that song that became the success of his lifetime. Sold almost a million copies of sheet music. And the most appealing part of it was how he wrote the lyrics. Henry pretended that he was old man Jenkins' grandchild recalling the clock which ran for 90 years and then stopped forever. And although you may never have heard that song, you know so very well a particular phrase in it, a phrase used therein for the first time anywhere. You see, before that song came along, such tall, standing, long-cased clocks were called pendulum clocks or pendulum clocks or coffin clocks, but it was Henry Work who wrote, quote, My grandfather's clock was too tall for the shelf, so it stood ninety years on the floor. It was taller by half than the old man himself, though it weighed not a penny weight more. So, yes, I do mean to say that although prior to that song long case clocks were referred to by a variety of names, because of Henry's verse, we have ever since called them grandfather's clocks. And now you know the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. Grandfather's clocks, I always heard them called grandfather clocks, became fashionable again following the hit tune. Tall clocks which had spent the previous decades standing unappreciated in dark corners of farmhouses now became a hot item. Once word spread of their sudden spike in value, owners and dealers shipped the tall clocks to New York or Philadelphia to be sold as an aged relic. Dealers wanting to take advantage of the increased value often placed a new old clock in a house where an estate auction was going to be held. They would tell the story that they intentionally left the clock off the list of items for sale so the heirs would have the opportunity to purchase it cheaply. But word got around pretty quickly that an antique grandfather's clock would be in the estate auctions. On auction day, large crowds gathered and got into a bidding war for the clocks. 
The new old clocks brought a premium price and were usually the most popular items at the auctions. The unsuspecting buyer never knew that the clock was a reproduction. They were unaware of the fraud. When the supply of the old clocks was exhausted, cabinet makers began making the new ones. In a letter to the editor of the Philadelphia Press in 1883, the author said he was traveling when he came across an old cabinet maker who was doing a novel and thriving business in a quiet way. He was turning out grandfather's clocks, manufacturing by hand these tall, tower-like clocks that were in vogue a century ago and which are now being bought up as relics and sent to all parts of the country. The cabinet maker told the traveler, I am kept very busy. There is a great demand for the old-fashioned clocks, and I can sell all I make. The dials are painted in the old-fashioned manner, and the clock is turned out so as to resemble a timepiece 100 or more years old. The traveler said, Everybody wants one of the tall coffin-like clocks that formerly swung their long pendulums in the corners of old farmhouses all over Pennsylvania. The famous song, Grandfather's Clock, has caused the old-fashioned timekeepers to be known as Grandfather's Clocks. Within two years of the song's release, it was a major hit. Newspapers reported, Not to know Grandfather's Clock argues yourself unknown. With its accompaniment of winding up, striking, ticking, and running down, it is nightly played in theater and concert halls to applauding auditors and is whistled by unnumbered, puckering mouths. Henry Clay Work was born in October of 1832. During the Civil War, Henry was a struggling printer who wrote songs on the side for extra money. When he offered to sell some songs to a firm in Chicago called Root and Katy, they recognized his potential and hired Henry to write songs for them. His first couple of songs, one of which was Kingdom Coming, were so popular that Root and Katy voluntarily increased his royalty percentage. Three more of Henry's songs were hits as well. Those included Wake Nicodemus, Babylon is Falling, and the one Mr. Harvey told us about, Marching Through Georgia. Royalties from the songs made Henry wealthy. Henry spent the next few years traveling the world. It was during this time that Henry stayed at the George Hotel in England. When he returned to the United States, Henry invested his money in approximately 300 acres of land on which he built houses and prepared to establish an extensive fruit farm. But this investment turned out to be unprofitable, and Henry lost all of his money and his property. Henry seemingly disappeared. In 1875, Katie, formerly of The Root and Katie Publishing Firm, started a new publishing company. He wanted someone to write popular music for him, and he thought of Henry. After a six-month search, Katie found Henry in New York where he was struggling to earn a living by writing magazine articles. It took just a little convincing for Henry to begin writing songs again. His first three songs for Katie were hits. They were The Mystic Veil, Sweet Echo Dell, and Grandfather's Clock. Katie said the three songs sold well from the start, but the latter, Grandfather's Clock, has eclipsed the others and, in fact, all other songs recently published. It is the hit of the times. By 1878, Henry was making $250 a month on Grandfather's Clock alone. In today's money, that would be about $7,700 per month for just the one song. His other songs earned him a healthy income as well. Now keep in mind, this was for sales of sheet music. Now let's put this song in a frame of reference. Just a year before Henry wrote Grandfather's Clock, Thomas Edison and his engineers came up with a way to record sound by using tinfoil coated cylinders. However, Edison set aside his work on the phonograph to concentrate on improvements to another invention, the incandescent light bulb. Speaking of Edison's phonograph, in 1905, the Edison Quartet recorded the first known recording of Henry's song, Grandfather's Clock, on an Edison cylinder. I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And as Paul Harvey would say, good day. 
Here's Henry Clay Works 1905 recording of Grandfather's Clock. Grandfather's Clock by the Edison Quartet. <laughs> Grandfather's clock was too large for the shelf, so it stood 19 years on the floor. It was taller by half than the old man himself, so it weighed not a penny weight more. It was bought on the morn on the day that he was born, and was always his treasure and pride. But it stopped, thought, never to go again. Never to go again when 